Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, the the 22nd of September, 2023. Good, as always, to have all of you on board. Today's show is brought to you by Textron Systems Ship-to-Shore Connector, the next-generation landing craft air cushion developed to provide advanced means to reach shorelines across the globe. Designed for a wide array of amphibious mission sets, the ship-to-shore connector offers increased payload capacity and speed with a service life of three decades for advanced performance and reliability. Learn more at textronsystems.com. All right, my guest today is Lieutenant Colonel Herb Bauscher, U.S. Marine Corps Reserve. He's the author of an article in the September issue of Proceedings. It's titled Air Denial Lessons from Ukraine. And if you have the print magazine, the article starts on pages 52 and 53. Herb, great to have you on the show. Bill, good to, good to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, just before we start into the questions, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your background. What's your MOS in the Marine Corps? And uh, has air defense been a major focus uh, of your Marine Corps career? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm an Air Command and Control Officer. I've been in the Marine Corps for um, a little over 20 years. Um, my training and, and operational experience wasn't specifically in air defense. Um, I was uh, air support control for most of my uh, company grade time. Um, I did attend the Stinger Weapons School at Fort Bliss back in, in 2001. And what I've observed over the last 20 years is air defense really hasn't been a priority for the Marine Corps um, at all. It's, it, it's, uh, it's more so now for sure. Um, uh, you know, but for the first 15 years or so of, of my career, it was uh, it was definitely low priority. So it's interesting to see things change. Well, it certainly didn't have to be a high priority in Afghanistan and Iraq where the, you know, the adversary wasn't coming at you from above. Right. So that's right. Uh, you know, but now with what's going on in uh, in Ukraine and then obviously the uh, uh, you know, the, the big scenario that everybody's talking about is China, Taiwan, Western Pacific, First Island chain you know, and their air defense uh, becomes much more important. So uh, let's start off with just a little bit of the background. Um, so Russia's unjustified illegal war in Ukraine has been front page news for about a year and a half now. Uh, this week, President Zelensky has been here in Washington. A lot of people have drawn lessons from the war, uh, from tactical to strategic, some lessons about munitions, about unmanned systems, about NATO, international relations, even lessons for the China-Taiwan situation. Um, but your article starts by saying Russia's war in Ukraine demonstrates the unchanged, or sorry, the changing character of war in the missile era. And you go on saying uh, Ukraine's military nullified the larger and better equipped Russian air force. How'd they do that? Yeah, so the the unchanging nature of war um, is uh, is eternal, as, as Klauswitz talked about. But as far as the changing character of war, um, I think this is uh, this was a great opportunity for us um, as a service and for me particularly uh, as I looked at this issue uh, last year at the War College on how how the character of war is changing in the missile era. And so General Berger uh, talked about the, the idea of, hey, we're now in this uh, missile era in his in his planning guidance. Um, so I think, like, first of all, um, there's a lot of, that we don't know and it's still Clearly, we're right in the middle of this conflict. Um, we don't really know a whole lot about the Russian side of, of the war. And uh, on the Ukrainian side, you know, there's there's OPSEC, uh, operational security concerns for why the Ukrainians may not have been um, completely forthright with information. But um, but I did uh, the best I could do with, with research that was available. And there is some pretty good research out there. And what I concluded, as, I, um, as the article notes, is that what the Ukrainians... Did I think it was pretty clear that they they um, they nullified the Russians' air force largely through mobile ground-based air defense. Um, early on in the war, there was there was some uh, uh, reporting that the U.S. provided intelligence to the Ukrainians that allowed them to to disperse their air defense and what what aircraft they did have. Um, that complicated the Russians' targeting. Um, so dispersion was a big part of this, and um, as the war went on past the first uh, few days, the uh, the Russians really were not able to do anything meaningful from the sky in terms of what maybe we would expect as a as a Western 
military in terms of air superiority. Um, clearly, our our uh, perceptions of maybe how the Russians should fight this in terms of gaining air superiority, it, it just didn't happen. And so the big question I asked and that we um, that this article looks at is, is how do they do that? And I think the like the short answer is is through mobile ground based air defense and using dispersion the way the way we um, in the Marine Corps have articulated um, in Expeditor Shooter Advanced Base Operations, EABO, the Commandant's planning guidance, um, all of that. I think what the what the Ukrainians did was to um, apply what what we're studying in a real world environment. And the end result is they they basically denied the Russians any sort of maneuver from the air, which is pretty remarkable considering the Russians at the outset of this conflict had a 10 to 1 advantage in aircraft over the Ukrainians. Yeah. What do you think some of the implications or, or lessons there are for today's Marine Corps, U.S. Marine Corps? Um and, and you, I think you already alluded to this, but does what we're seeing on the battlefields in Ukraine, does it align with the Marine Corps force design 2030 and with expeditionary advanced base operations? And, you know, if so, how? Yeah, I, I think it, it's hard to draw direct um, parallels and to say, hey, this validates our concepts. But I think in total, based on what we've seen and the, the um, reporting that is that is uh, that is available open source from pretty authoritative analysts. Um, I think it's it's pretty much you have to conclude that what's gone on in Ukraine, at least in 2022, um, proves that the concepts that we have been working on in the Marine Corps um, in the Navy as well that these concepts are sound. Um, that being mobile, lightweight, low signature is absolutely essential in the in the missile era, and that's what the Ukrainians have demonstrated. So um, the Commandant's planning guidance and some of General Berger's uh, writings where he t attempted to articulate why we're heading in this direction, it was all based on the proliferation of long-range precision missiles. And that's what we've seen in the Ukraine. We've seen um, that dispersal in the missile era um, with sensors and long-range precision, precision missiles is absolutely essential. So... That's what the Ukrainians have demonstrated. I think um, every war is unique, and I don't know that it's that it's uh, it's a good idea at this point to basically say, "Hey, what happened in Ukraine uh, can happen anywhere else in the world." But I think, in in total, um, the war in 2022, at least when the Ukrainians were on the strategic defense, shows that our concepts are the right direction to head for the Marine Corps. Yeah, interesting. And I would add that, you know, from my unclassified, uh, you know, cheap seats here in the peanut gallery, uh, it appears to me that a lot of the, Rus the Russians are firing a lot of missiles and, and uh, you know, att attack drones at things that are fixed in Ukraine, right? So you see them attacking apartment complexes to inflict damage on the civilian, you know, populace. You see them attacking the electric power grid, things that don't move. That seems to be where they're having success, but the stuff where the Ukrainians disaggregate and are mobile and, you know, uh, and or have, uh, uh, you know, decent air defense capabilities, that's where you see this, you know, the, the, the Russians don't seem to be very successful. Yeah, I, I think they um, early on, um, the Ukrainians really executed better. So it's it's uh, it's also a question of which side executed better. But I think there's no question um, from looking at the reporting that we do have available for 2022 um, that we're heading in the right the right direction with EABO and uh, DMO on the Navy side. So one of the things that jumped out at me as I read your article, as we worked on it, um, is, you know, up, up until a few years ago, U.S. forces, U.S. military in general, we tended to talk about air power in terms of are we going to have air superiority or air dominance, right? It, those are pretty high up on the Maslow's hi hierarchy of military needs, you know, and air denial is, is much lower. It's a much more limited goal. And so I'm, I'm curious, I just throw this out to you, is the idea of air superiority or air dominance, you think it's dead in great power war? Yeah, I, it's a, it's a question that, uh, I think we we have to we have to look at. Um, I 
came down on the side of, I think we have to pursue air superiority. I mean, I think, uh, we, we owe that to our ground forces and, and we're not going to, we're not going to get away from that. I think there's some, uh, some observers and, and analysts out there that say, Hey, against a peer competitor in today's world, um, it's, it's fruitless to think that we're going to get air superiority. Um, I think we have the technology that allows us to pursue air superiority and, and we shouldn't just say, we're not going to, we're not going to pursue it. We have to, but we need to be realistic about what we can achieve against a military, like, um, you know, the great power, like a China uh, military. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think what what the article uh, points to is is another option in a situation where you're in a competitive battle space, um, and maybe you can achieve air superiority in a in a sector or um, or across multiple sectors. Um, what the Ukrainians did in pursuing air denial was to provide another option that I don't think we've fully considered as a service and and uh, maybe even as a joint force. Yeah, so talk about that. Just, you know, pull that forward a little bit more with uh, with air denial. You know, what how would you define that? I don't you know, don't, don't need a joint pub definition, but how would you define what air denial is and how um, how do you think the Ukrainians have uh, have thought about that or how they've pursued it or how it's, uh, you know, been been, uh, uh, you know, useful for them? Yeah, so. In the situation that we that we had um, last year and and I think continuing into today is where both both sides uh, neither side controls the air, um, so neither side has air superiority. And when I was talking about this with with some of the the faculty down at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base last year, as I was doing my research, um, one of the faculty there and I had a conversation about this, and it's his. His observation is this is a situation that's basically air parity where you have uh, neither opponent controls the air. So in a situation where you have air parity, an air denial strategy, which the Ukrainians executed, um, can give one side an advantage. So the, the takeaway is that you don't need air superiority the way we in the Joint Force and in the, in the Marine Corps um, think about it. You don't necessarily need air superiority to gain an advantage on the battlefield. And that's what the Ukrainians um, showed in 2022. Got it. Um, your article points out that after the first month or so of the war, Russia's air forces largely stayed out of Ukrainian airspace and they relied more heavily on missile and unmanned aircraft strikes rather than, you know, uh, Sukhois and, and, and MiGs, you know, dropping bombs on the, on the battlefield. Uh, give us a sense of the scope of Russia's airstrikes, particularly missile strikes uh, on Ukraine. Yeah. So again, with, with this, um, I think there's, a, there's limitations on what we know. Um, I tried to find the best sources I could out there. There are some, the, the Royal United Services Institute, Ruzi over in, over in England, um, did some really good work on this. Um, some others, I think the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Um, but what we do seem to know based on 2022 is that the Russians launched um, what Ruzi described as hundreds of sorties against Ukraine in the first three days of the war. Um, so uh, what we might characterize as, a, as an attempt by the Russians to achieve air superiority, um, but it failed. And neither side has achieved air superiority. Um, after those first three days, as, as, we, as we talked about um, uh, a few minutes ago, as, as the Ukrainians were able to use their mobile ground-based air defense to, to inflict a, an air denial campaign, um, the Russians, as you observed, they've really moved towards this, um, this missile, these uh, missile barrages, you know, the use of these, uh, uh, what some people call suicide drones, the Shahed drones. Um, throughout the middle of 2022, we saw a, just a, a massive, uh, series of missile barrages, as you might recall, back during the summer months and, and early the spring and through the summer. Um, some of the, the research that I did showed that through May, the Russians may have fired as many as 2000 cruise missiles. Uh, that was just in the that first. Through May of 22, the first three months, right? 
Yeah, um, 2,000 cruise missiles and then uh, 240 ballistic missiles. Just a remarkable barrage of missiles against um, Ukraine. And their their Air Force really through the end of the year was was largely ineffective. Some of the reporting uh, indicated they were using their Air Force in kind of this um, rudimentary close air support role, staying behind behind the lines and sort of lobbing bombs toward the front. So um, it was, uh, you know, the Air Force in terms of the, the flying uh, crewed aircraft uh, was was largely uh, ineffective. Um, just as as an example, back during um, there was one week in March, you, you may recall this, the, some of the reporting showed that the Ukrainians shot down at least eight Russian fighter jets during that one week in March. So um, it was it was really a, a remarkable one that the that the Russians were so ineffective with their air force and, and two that the Ukrainians were able to, to nullify that air force with, with ground-based air defense. Yeah. And the opener image for your article is one of those Russian fighters, uh, you know, lying, yeah. lying in a field, right. Uh, great image, but that makes the point you're making. Um, so you mentioned a minute ago, the Royal United Services Institute over in Great Britain and, and your article quotes one of their experts, Justin Bronk, as saying that the Russian Air Force has not been particularly effective at giving the Russian ground forces an advantage. So question to you, do you think this is because the Ukrainians have been particularly effective or do you think it's because of Russian incompetence? So that was another theme that's come out of this war is that you know, the, the Russians, their planning was ineffective. They thought they would just march into downtown Kiev. They, they sent all their forces down a couple of key LOCs that once blocked, you know, that was like the, you know, the highway of death in Baghdad, 1991, right? Um, so wh where do you stand on that? Is, is it, uh, you know, Ukrainian effectiveness or, or Russian incompetence or somewhere in between? Yeah, I mean, I think it's both. Um... I, again, we don't really have a whole lot on the Russian side. I, I think as as um, reporting comes out, as as the years go by, and we get a fuller picture of what actually happened, uh, we may get a better sense for for what happened on the Russian side. But I mean, it's it's pretty clear. Um, a colleague of mine did some reporting on the on the Russian side of this whole question, and was able to demonstrate pretty conclusively that there was just a lot of incompetence going on on the Russian side. So I think for sure. Uh, I think it was both. I think we saw the Ukrainians execute very well. We saw the Russians fail at execution, um, at least in 2022, when the Ukrainians were on the on the defense strategically. Um, you know, Bronk, uh, you mentioned Justin Bronk at the Royal United Services Institute. Uh, um, for your listeners and, and readers, he's he's a he's a pretty well respected uh, British. Uh, analyst on the question of air power in today's world. And, um, and he talked a lot about the Russians, uh, for example, not having the type of training that, that we would expect um, in suppression of enemy air defenses. So that, that SEAD mission, uh, clearly they failed at. And partly, the, you know, there's some reasons for that. There could be um, the type of pilot training that, that they, that they didn't get um, that, that we, uh, that we pursue very seriously in, in that mission set, they they clearly didn't get. So I think there were a lot of factors, but I think the answer, short answer to your question, I think it's both. Um, but as as the years go by, I mean, we we definitely need to study this conflict more. And as as things come out on the on the Russian side, um, I think we'll get a fuller answer to that question. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Seed or Seed. Uh, that that's a really key point. That uh, it is a big focus of uh, U.S. Joint Air Forces. Uh, and it's, uh, but it's also something that's kind of high up the hierarchy of, of mission areas. And, you know, it takes a lot of, a lot of practice. It takes a lot of integration. There are, you know, pretty advanced weapons, uh, electronic jamming, warfare, those kinds of things that, that all go into that. And if you don't have a lot of flight hours, if you don't have a lot of range time, uh, you know, doing CAD well is, uh, is pretty challenging. That's a good point. Um, so I want to talk a bit about sea denial because you bring this up, sea denial by air. And so we've talked about air denial here and how critical that is. Um, uh, but, you, you know, we got to tie it back into, you know, for a lot of uh, force design. We had, you know, General Berger's been on the show before and he's talked about sea denial and about the Marine Corps' contribution to sea denial and about, you know, things like the Marine Corps uh, procuring the Nemesis system, which is... Um, 
uh, you know, that naval strike missile uh, that can be deployed ashore in these small expeditionary bases and inside the first island chain, et cetera. So, you know, interesting over the last five years or so to see the Marine Corps really focus on sea denial. In other words, be a, a another weapon in a, in a numbered fleet uh, commander's hands, right? So you've got, you know, ship to ship anti-ship missiles, but you've also got now Marine Corps based uh, marine capable shore based anti ship missiles. So, uh, start with the doctrine, um, cause you mentioned it in your article, uh, does Marine Corps current Marine Corps doctrine talk about air denial? And, and if it does, how does it tie it with, uh, with the concept of sea denial? Yeah. So, you know, this sea denial, as you, as you, um, describe it's, it's the Marine Corps, um, effort to support the Navy in achieving sea control against a, a pure competitor against, you know, in, in contested air, airspace and contested battle space. Um, and no, the, the stand in forces um, concept that the article talks about a little bit does, um, does describe and more or less, um, you know, point us towards air denial uh because it talks about all the dimensions of the battle space, but this is not something that's in doctrine. Um, it's uh, it's not in the anti-air warfare uh, publication doctrine that's that's uh, in the footnotes of the article. Uh, and I think that's important because it's the doctrine is going to show our forces, um, our younger Marines, you know what's important and what they need to train for. And so, amending doctrine by you know, putting this type of strategy in our, in our documents, um, in our doctrine documents is going to show the way forward and say, Hey, we need to train for this, for this capability. Um, right now, the doctrine talks about ground-based air defense as, as more of a protection capability. Um, there's no, there's no discussion of air denial in the sense of, you know, the way the Ukrainians um, used their ground-based air defense as a maneuverable asset, as an offensive, um, even though they were on the strategic defense, they were using it um, basically as an offensive asset to take away the, uh, the Russian Air Force capability. So no, it's not in doctrine. Yes, we need to put it in doctrine. We need to train for it. And um, I feel confident that as we have these discussions in the service about what happened last year in Ukraine about what we can learn from it, uh, what it means to fight in a contested battle space that, that we're going to, we're going to amend doctrine, not only for this, but, you know, for other um, uh, parts of our, of the MAGTEF that we really need to question our assumptions on. Uh, so, okay. Moving on from doctrine to capability. So, uh, you know, a lot of folks, li listeners will be thinking about, you know, F-35 in this, where does the, uh, the Marine Corps yeah. F-35, uh, you know, stand and, and also, uh, you know, ground-based air defense capability. So, um, will Marine F-35s, uh, provide that air superiority or air denial over stand-in forces? And then where's the Marine Corps on ground-based air defenses these days? Yeah. So with the F-35, um, I feel very confident in that platform. It's certainly better than anything the Russians or the Chinese operate, um, but it's not invincible. And uh, I'm not a naval aviator, but I'm sure if, if you have one on the show, they could, they could tell you that um, it's it's something we can we can be confident in as a platform. But uh, with with modern air defenses like the Russians, like the Chinese use the S-400s out there, um, it's not it's not invincible. So yeah, I think that. Our F-35s and um, the flight crew that operates those, they're going to do their best. But we need, uh, and I think this this um, this campaign in the Ukraine last year shows that we need mobile ground-based air defense in the MAGTAF um, to complement that air, air superiority fighter, the, the F-35. So um, if we're assuming that we're going to get air superiority uh, in any conflict, against any adversary, we need to question our assumptions. And I think we are doing that as a service, but um, yeah. I think this, this, uh, this conflict should, should cause us to, to reassess our assumptions in that respect. Um, so, and I think you asked about the um, 
air defense capabilities? Yeah, current current you know organic ground based air defense capabilities. Uh, you know, my my sense is uh, the Marines have got uh, a, a pretty decent, uh, ver- but 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 you know uh, highly mobile capable Stinger based. Um, but that's pretty short range, right? And pretty low altitude kind of thing. And generally, uh, you know, IR, uh, you know, the sensor is based on IR, not a not a radar guided missile or or a semi active radar guided missile. So, um, you know, the, the Marine Corps divested of the IHAWK batteries. Mm-hmm. We, you know, back when I was a JO, Marines had IHAWK, right? And then got out of that business. And I think that there's a sense of the need to bring something back that's sort of that medium range. Um, mobile, mobile capability, but not, yeah. not there yet, right? Yeah, so um, that's right. I mean, now we have we have Stinger currently, and that's that's been the case since, uh, as you mentioned, since the late '90s. The service got rid of Hawk in 1998. That was the medium range surface to air missile that the that the Marine Corps had. Um, so yeah, currently all we operate is Stinger. So that's that's a that's a known gap. Um, there's a system out there that's that's uh, Medium range intercept capability, uh, MRIC that is that is being developed. That is, um, it's not operational. Uh, the latest I think I saw was FY twenty six on that system. Um, uh, again, these are capabilities that I think the service knows is a gap, and that we're working as a service to to remedy. Um, but we're not there yet, and it's going to be you know still a couple of years before we get there. Um, but beyond those those um, those medium range. Um, assets that that emric would would supply um i think we just we need a a larger number and a wider range of of air defense systems um and that that's yeah, that's what the ukrainians uh had they had a, a wide range the 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 buck the sa11 the um they did have man pads like like the stinger um but other systems um s300 is their their medium range um, plus they were using um, a range of just small uh, caliber anti-aircraft guns to take out, um, for example, the Shahed drones. And, uh, you know, th- there's a efficiency uh, factor here that I think we can't deny. It's, it doesn't make sense to fire all of your stingers at these, you know, $40,000 drones. Stingers are, a, it's a six figure asset. Um, and we have to keep those, for cruise missiles, for you know the real threats against the MAGTAF, the aircraft, the cruise missiles, the ballistic, um, we can't defend against ballistic missiles as a MAGTAF. So I, I think the bottom line is we need um, that capability that is that is going to be fielded, the MRIC, the medium range. Um, that's a great start, um, but we need it sooner rather than later, and we need a, a wider range of of ground based air defense and and just more numbers, more quantity out there for sure. Uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, electronic, you know, uh, what, what, what I'm looking for the word, um, uh, electric weapons. So electronic countermeasures, uh, you know, z- z- high power microwave, uh, th- those kinds of weapons that uh, would be, y- you can shoot them, you know, a lot more times, you know, it, there's no reload required, right? It's just electricity required to, to be able to, uh, you know, potentially uh, destroy the electronics on board a either an incoming weapon or an incoming drone, right? Where, where's the Marine Corps with with that kind of capability? Yeah, for sure. And and I didn't really fixate on the the capabilities, the actual systems. I, I think a lot of people get um, in, in the military, we get fixated on, oh, you got to have MRIC or this type of system or that. Um, we just we need a range of of more capable mobile ground-based air defense and more of it. And yes, I have, I have heard that the next generation is, is, uh, the laser, um, you know, the laser air defense. Uh, I heard general Smith, our current commandant, um, talk about this a few months ago that hey, this is the next generation of air defense. And it's already been something that's being looked at, uh, in, in the service. Um, it, it, makes a lot of sense, especially if, if it's, you know, more economical. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think the implication of your question, uh, one of the things we're seeing in the, in Ukraine is if you run out of missiles for these systems, then the systems obviously are no good. And right. 
um, the other side is going to get air superiority pretty quick. So that, that's one of the one of the observations that um, that folks have seen in, in Ukraine is if the Ukrainians were to run out of missiles and ordnance for all of these these weapon systems, the, the Russians would have the opportunity to to control the skies. So um, I think there are known um, supply chain issues with with missiles, with ordnance that um, that lend urgency to your question. And if, if we can have something like a, a system that uses, um, that uses lasers, for example, where we don't have to worry about the supply chain of, of ordnance, um, that seems like a fantastic idea and something we need to, to speed up um, research and development on and fielding that out to the operating forces. Yeah, I mentioned this on a, a previous podcast. I, I think it was one of the ones I did uh, at Modern Day Marine a couple months ago. Uh, walk in the convention floor there uh, at that at that event. One of the things I saw it was so many different vendors are now offering small UASs, and uh, and one of the vendors, and I, I'm, if I say which one, I might probably I might be wrong, so I won't say which company I thought it was, but one of the vendors uh, I was talking to uh, had a you know number of these different. Uh, you know, small, small, you know, we're talking like four or five foot wingspan kind of uh, unmanned air systems. And one had a variety of different payloads. And one of the payloads that this guy talked to me about was a high powered microwave uh, payload. And, and he said, and I said, well, okay, so w- what's the use case for that? And he said, well, for one, um, you know, if an incoming swarm of drones is coming at you, how do you, how do you manage, how do you handle a, a swarm of drones? And he said, you know, you launch this thing into the midst of them and the high power microwave weapon, you know, radiates, right? And it just fries the electronics and all of them. So they kind of drop out of the sky. I thought, well, that's that's a very interesting uh, capability. So Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. Uh, connect for me, if you would. Connect uh, for the listeners the air denial and sea denial, how that goes together in your mind. So... We can't do sea denial without air denial. It's it's one of the dimensions in the battle space. Um, right now, all we have is is stinger, and I would say if the if the enemy can fly whatever it wants at will, um, then we can't do sea denial. So we need a mix of fifth generation aircraft. That's the uh, the F thirty five and whatever's coming next, and mobile ground based air defense. So um, you know the 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 stand-in force is, um, you know, you hear a lot about it's operating inside the weapons engagement zone, the enemy's yeah. weapons engagement zone. And so we're talking about contested battle space here. So the air is going to be contested. Every domain is contested. So um, I think we need to we need to have a conversation for sure as a service. And I know I know we're, we're getting after this, but it, I think it needs to happen with more urgency about the ability to defend against air and missile threats inside the enemy's weapon engagement zone. So without being able to do that, um, we're not going to be able to achieve sea denial. We're not going to be able to help the Navy achieve sea control against an advanced military like like the PLA. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, we're running short on time, but I wanted to, to point out that one of the, you know, you, you, you have a sentence or two in your article about the fact that uh, Marines doing, you know, stand in force uh, operations, you know, inside the first island chain. One of the air defense options, op- options for Marines ashore is, you know, Navy Aegis at sea. Um, but again, this is also a place where, you know, the question is how close in uh, can Navy, you know, Aegis destroyers and cruisers operate in that contested environment. So yes, Aegis has got a capability. Yes, there's, you know, you're talking SM2, SM6, SM3, etc. cetera. Uh, but again, they're operating also in inside the danger, inside the weapons engagement zone. And and uh, your article, you know, brought that out as well. So um, mindful of time here, uh, you know, any parting shots or saved rounds? Yeah, I think it's a great point is uh, after we put the Marines ashore, the MAGTAF is ashore um, in these expeditionary advance bases, they're going to have to have air and missile defense. They can't rely on the Aegis, the cruisers. Um, I don't think we can rely on the Army's Patriot system, the, the cruise missile defense system. There's just not enough of them to go around. So, And they're, and they're not very mobile either. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, going back to mobility, low signature, mobile lightweight that's going to be key so those are those are the types of 
um, features that we want in our air defense, air defense systems going forward. Yeah. Great points. Yeah. I, I can't think of a better way to wrap it up than, than that comment right there. So uh, my guest today has been Lieutenant Colonel Herb Bauscher, U.S. Marine Corps Reserve. His article is in the September issue of Proceedings. It's titled Air Denial Lessons from Ukraine. Herb, great to have you on the show. Thanks for writing for Proceedings. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. This episode was brought to you by Textron Systems Ship to Shore Connector, the next generation landing craft air cushion developed to provide advanced means to reach shorelines across the globe. Designed for a wide array of amphibious mission sets, the Ship to Shore Connector offers increased payload capacity and speed with a service life of three decades for advanced performance and reliability. Learn more at textronsystems.com. Special thanks to our producer, Heather Legg, for this and every episode. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.